We light a light in the name of God who creates life, in the name of the Savior who loves life, in the name of the Spirit who is the fire of life.
as we do on the first Sunday of each month, we acknowledge that we worship on the land of the Kanza, Osage, and the Wichita. And where I grew up, it was the land of the Pawnee, Sioux, Winnebago, and the Omaha people. We thank them for their care and respect for this land and the acknowledgement of injustice that, of their forced removal. We ask the Spirit to heal our histories and find new paths of right relationships with them and all creation. May it be so from this day forward. The call to worship is in number 852 in Voices Together. I will read the regular type and you the people who are gathered here and at home can read the bold type. In the beginning, when it was very quiet, the word was with God. In the beginning, when it was very dark, God said, let there be light. And there was light. When the time was right, God sent a son. invite children or adults who are young at heart to come forward at this point. You might want to come a little closer because I have pictures to show you today. And the rest of you will just have to imagine. Well, today I would like to talk with you just a little bit about Mennonite Central Committee and what MCC does to help people around the world in the name of Christ. Several months ago, we learned about Germaine and her daughters and how they had to walk a long way to get water and how MCC helped bring clean water closer 
to them, their homes. And we started collecting coins to help with getting more water into the hands of more people. And look what we have now. Does anybody want to try to lift it? <laughs> I've stopped lifting it. It's on rollers now. <laughs> the last time we weighed it, which was two weeks ago, was 81 pounds of coins and bills and checks, too. So, wow. Thank you to you and everyone out here for helping gather money to help people have more water. Because of you, this is happening. So MCC helps people have clean water, but they also help in many other ways, like some you see here. It's kind of like a river of gifts today. Do you recognize any of these? This is a school kit, yes, with notebooks and things for school supplies. Anything else you recognize? A quilt or a comforter to help people with warmth. Meat, canned meat. I know a lot of you have helped can meat for people who are hungry. What else do you notice? Do you know what these are? These big five-gallon buckets are relief kits. They're for people pretty much who have lost everything. They have towels, soap, laundry soap, shampoo, combs, um, all kinds of things, plus a bucket to use for gathering water or washing. Okay. Whoops. It's going to topple, I'm afraid. Anything else? Oh, over here, just leave that one. Um, this is a hygiene kit to help people stay clean and healthy. Hand towel, um, toothbrushes, fingernail clippers, and an infant care kit with things to help a new baby stay healthy. Yeah. OK, so I would like you to meet some of the people who have received some of these kinds of gifts. Let's see here. In Zambia, this is Lucia and Beauty. They each got a school kit. Helps them go to school. In the Ukraine, this is Nadia. You see what she just got? A relief kit. Yep, she looks pretty happy. And in Uganda, this is Ruth and her baby, Panina. They just got an infant care kit. And here's a mother and her three daughters. Can you figure out what they received? A comforter, relief kit, school kits, actually multiples. A hygiene kit, yep. And something else, some meat, cans of meat, okay? And one last one to share with you. Here's a girl who lives in Ukraine. This is one of my favorites. Can you figure out what this girl's family just received? You have to look kind of closely and see if you can figure out what. There's a box. They've received a box of meat, and the girl has taken the box and turned it into a dollhouse. Now, on Friday and Saturday of this week is the Kansas Mennonite Relief Sale. It's a big event to raise funds for MCC. There are lots of ways that people in this congregation support the sale and MCC by donating items, baking Swebach and pies, going to the sale, helping set up the sale, volunteering before or during or after the sale. BCMC and people here do so much to support what MCC is able to do. Thank you. Every dollar that is spent at the sale goes to projects like clean water and to ship or send kits, buckets, comforters around the world in the name of Christ. 
Let's pray. Dear God, today we think about Jermaine, Ruth, Panina, Lucia and Beauty and Nadia and so many others. We ask your blessing on the work of MCC and the Kansas Relief Sale. Bless these gifts and the others ready to go with them, these gifts from our hands. May they become hope, health, and warmth in the name of Christ. Amen.
I will be reading from Acts 4, verses 32 through 35 from the Inclusive Bible. The community of believers was of one mind and one heart. None of them claimed anything as their own. Rather, everything was held in common. The apostles continued to testify with great power to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and they were all given great respect, nor was anyone needy among them. For those who owned property or houses would sell them and give the money to the apostles. It was then distributed to any members who might be in need. Now from John 20, 19 through 31. In the evening of that same day, the first day of the week, the doors were locked in the room where the disciples were for fear of the temple authorities. Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Having said this, the Savior showed them the marks of crucifixion. The disciples were filled with joy when they saw Jesus, who said to them again, Peace be with you. As Abba God sent me, so I'm sending you. After saying this, Jesus breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you retain anyone's sins, they are retained. It happened that one of the 12, Thomas, nicknamed Didymus, or twin, was absent when Jesus came. The other disciples kept telling him, we've seen Jesus. Thomas's answer was, I'll never believe it without putting my finger in the nail marks and my hand into the spear wound. On the eighth day, the disciples were once more in the room, and this time Thomas was with them. Despite the locked doors, Jesus came and stood before them saying, peace be with you. Then to Thomas, Jesus said, take your finger and examine my hands. Put your hand into my side. Don't persist in your unbelief, but believe. Thomas said in response, my savior and my God. Jesus then said, you've become a believer because you saw me. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs, as well signs not recorded here in the presence of the disciples. But these have been recorded to help you believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the only begotten, so that by believing you may have life in Jesus' name.
May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts breathe with you, O God, our rock and our wind and our resonance. The main thing that we heard at the end of the scripture reading from John is that we are to believe. The writer of the Gospel, John, wants us to believe in some particular content about Jesus, namely that Jesus is the Messiah, the only begotten. Once again, we have this exclusivism, same as what I called out last week from Peter, And there are certainly reasons why the Johannine community feels like they need to be exclusive. But as usual, the Bible leaks. I've used that term before, the Bible leaks. And by it, I mean that the truth of Jesus leaks out even when the authors of Scripture don't necessarily mean it to or when they're trying to prove a different point. And oftentimes the point that the authors are trying to make gets skewed towards their own desire for power and control. In short, it gets skewed towards the patriarchy and the ways that these men feel like they need to mediate Jesus' presence. Baked into the Bible, on the one hand, is the need for some to harness power and control. And on the other hand, There are these loving, liberating, compassionate, connecting movements that always leak out. These themes of liberation and control often seem to weave seamlessly so we don't notice, but it's something that I'm particularly interested in. The Bible leaks. We see it in Jesus' encounter with the disciples that we read about today. We get something a bit different than what seems like the summation creed of belief that Jesus is the Messiah, the only begotten. Both encounters with Jesus, when he first meets the disciples and then a week later, when he also appears to Thomas, three times in these two encounters, Jesus calls for peace to be upon them. Despite all of the negative circumstances surrounding their upturned lives, despite their great fear, Jesus speaks peace upon them. It's a trusting, non-anxious, non-fearful presence, no matter what. This is what Jesus wants for those who have been closest to him. A sense of peace within them and a peace among them. This is what Jesus wants. And not only that utterance about peace, but somehow Jesus empowers them with his breath, which is connected to the Holy Spirit. This is a gift of empowerment, a gift again of peace. Take a deep breath, calm down, feel God's presence. Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they're forgiven. If you retain anyone's sins, they're retained. Somehow in this breathing, there's something to do with forgiveness. I'm not going to get too far into what exactly is meant by forgiveness because it's complicated, but I'll just say that forgiveness is not what we normally think. It's not forgive and forget. It still requires accountability, but it's an accountability born out of love and not the need to punish. But generally, I think Jesus is instructing that the movement of the Spirit, if you are abiding in the peace that Jesus breathes out, you can't be holding on to grudges and wounds and seeking vengeance. It doesn't work. It will eat you up. You have to feel the release of the weight. Dwell in peace. Breathe the Holy Spirit. Stay focused on God's presence. Thomas could not believe that God's presence was still active and alive after Jesus' death. And the disciples didn't quite get it. All they could say was, we have seen the Lord. They didn't let the peace settle deeply within them. They didn't take seriously the breath of the Holy Spirit that Jesus entrusted to them. They're still thinking very literally, including Thomas, that it's all about Jesus' body, Jesus' physical presence. They can't understand that Jesus' presence is expanding. Thomas is so literal that he says, I'm not going to believe anything unless Jesus comes back, and I put my finger into the nail marks on his side and my hand into the spear wound. 
Jesus did come back, and I think kind of rolling his eyes, saying, okay, take your finger and examine my hands, put your hand into my side. Don't persist in your unbelief, but believe. And believe Thomas did, exclaiming, my Savior and my God. What is the nature of this belief? Is Jesus really asking for, and is Thomas really declaring that he now has an accurate understanding of Jesus and Jesus' relationship to God? That all of this encountering Jesus is to, pro is to prove a concept, that Jesus is the Messiah, the only begotten? It's all about an idea of how Jesus relates to God? It's hard for me to believe that. Not only has this trust in an abstract concept, a prefrontal concept, not only has it guided exclusivism that leads to war and violence, destruction of people and creation, but it has separated us from actually seeking the experience of God on a daily, hourly, minute-by-minute, breath-by-breath experience. We have an abstract concept of God and we go about our daily living not growing into peace, not growing in the Holy Spirit, not growing into forgiveness. Jesus is not asking for an abstract belief in who he is. He's asking Thomas, he's asking the disciples, he's asking all of us to trust him. Primarily, the belief is an act of entrusting ourselves to Jesus and the Spirit to always be with us. It's not an abstract belief about something, but it's practicing the presence. I'm helping to facilitate the faith exploration class these days for some who are in the high school youth group. And the million dollar question is, is this true? Is Christianity the way? If I'm going to commit myself to this faith, then I want some certainty that this is the right path. Unfortunately, I cannot adequately answer that question. I've not been down other paths. And how long would you need to go down another path to be able to discern if it's correct? And what would be the markers along the way that would let you know if you're going in the right direction? Perhaps if your life is moving towards anger, addiction, violence, lack of respect for others, those would seem like red flags. But for me, I break it down pretty simply with two questions. They're just kind of a baseline, but they make sense. First of all, I want all of my encounters with people to be positive. Is someone better off for knowing me? I want my presence to be net positive with you. I think we can all kind of tell if we're a drag on a relationship or if we're lifting it up. Are you better off knowing me? The second question I ask is, is love growing within me? Do I have more love for those I know and those I meet? Or am I growing more cynical, more angry, less trusting, less loving? I think we know within us when love is growing. I don't think it's that complicated. Am I more loving, more open, more expansive, more generous with others and creation? Or am I closing in? Shutting out because everyone or everything is increasingly bad or wrong or stupid. Don't we have enough self-awareness to, to gauge that within ourselves? Is love growing within me? And if I hold these two questions in front of me, are you better off for knowing me and is love growing within me? Then the religious question is, can Jesus help me with that? Can Jesus help in my relationships to be net positive, in love growing? Can I entrust myself into Jesus' presence so that I can grow in love, so that I can be positive, a healing presence? This is not particularly complicated. It's not about beliefs in heaven or hell or only begotten Son and Savior. It's about answering within. Does love grow? Is there peace? Can I forgive? Jesus, can you hold me and guide me in this? Am I part of you as these things happen? And by extension, can being a part of the church, a community that tries to embody Jesus, can you all help me better grow into Jesus' presence? 
Can you hold me, guide me as love grows, as we foster a spirit of peace and forgiveness together? How this happens exactly in other communities of faith, I don't know. But I do know that many communities of faith, certainly including Christianity, are more interested in being right than in being loving. And in that, I want no part. Let us know that Jesus lives by practicing the presence of Jesus. Let us place love above everything else. May our experiences be characterized by peace, by forgiveness, by generosity. I'm going to close by mentioning the passage that we heard from the book of Acts. The verse right before the ones that we heard read states that they all were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to proclaim the word of God boldly. So there was this presence that fell upon the people that not only impelled them to speak, but also led them to be extremely generous. Of course, that impulse of generosity quickly got organized and twisted, but there was this presence, this very generous spirit, the spirit of God. Let us focus on living in that spirit, the spirit that Jesus continues to breathe. As we sing our next hymn, let us move with Jesus' presence, singing our full body knowledge. I know that my Redeemer lives. Glory, hallelujah. Jesus, who is our peace, our breath, our forgiveness, our generosity. Amen.
There's one correction for your bulletin. The memorial service for Donald Kaufman will be on Saturday the 13th and not Friday. But you cross out the word Friday and write in Saturday, all the rest is correct. I will be praying this morning for Marilyn Stuckey, who is receiving care at the Newton Medical Center. Shall we pray? We pray and praise the creator, sustainer, and giver of all things that have been, are now, and that which awaits to come. As we ponder on the words we have heard and those we have sung, our hearts are filled with joy and hope. Hope for a future that will shine more brightly than today. Hope for a future where justice will prevail. And hope for a future where God's presence and redemptive being will be known throughout this land and across the globe. And yet our hearts are heavy as we reflect on the realities of our daily lives and the times in which we live. We pray for those who are weary from carrying many burdens, may they find rest. We pray for those who rejoice daily, may their joy continue. We pray for those whose lives are filled with music and for those for whom music has faded. May they all find hope and rest in your redemptive spirit. We especially pray for those who are ill and for those who have recently lost loved ones. May your presence bring peace and healing to their bodies and souls. And in the season of the eclipse, we're aware of those who live in the eclipse of hope and of joy and of peace. May your light shine again for their path and bring a new day. On this day, our hearts are heavy with the events of our own time, the wars in Eastern Europe and the Middle East weigh upon us as we seek understanding and a restoration for peace. We feel so paralyzed by these events, so inept in voicing our hope for peace, and our prayer is that we, locally, and the nations of the world, will recognize that divided we fall, and in united we may stand. As we work toward redemptive paths with the First Nation peoples of our land, May all nations find a way toward wholeness and liberation as their path into the future. And thus, we, me, we, and thus may we, as a poet reminds us, lift every voice and sing to earth and heaven ring, ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the roaring sea. May our lives and voices resound as loud as the rolling sea as we seek liberty and justice for all. We pray also for the needs of this congregation. Guide us as we seek new leadership and prepare for new leadership and commit ourselves to work for unity, understanding, and toward a community that is greater than we as individuals are by ourselves. We pray also this morning for Marilyn Stuckey and all her loved ones as she recovers from her recent fall. Guide us, O oh God, in the coming days and weeks so that we might live in harmony with each other, with the earth, and stand in awe of the cosmos, which is above and beyond us all. May the God of the sun and of the moon and of the earth and all of the universe be our guide and light our path. Hear this prayer and all those spoken and since words often fail us, those that remain unspoken today, guide us in our endeavors. Amen.
repeating our final verse. Christ is alive and comes to bring good news to this and every age, till earth and sky and ocean ring with joy, with justice, love, and praise. Amen. <laughs>